bundles, so vector bundle of a manifold together with a uh, anchor map, so this the vector bundle map into the tangent bundle of the manifold and a bracket on the sections, which satisfies a kind of Leibniz rule. And Lie algebraid has almost all of the paraphernalia of the usual symplectic geometry. For example, there's an associated the, the RAM complex. You can look at the forms uh, of the, 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 the sections of the exterior algebra of the dual bundle. And then there's a naturally defined exterior derivative, which is defined by almost exactly the same formula as you know for the, the, the ordinary Durham differential. Uh, if alpha, uh, or alpha k form, an a, an a form of degree k. Um, D alpha is a K plus one form and you can plug in sections. The sigma stand for sections of A. And how do you compute that? Well, you form these functions by plugging in K, K sections. Uh, and then you take the uh, anchor of the remaining section. So this is a vector field. And I uh, differentiate this function along this vector field. And that's the first term. And then the second term involves the bracket operation of the uh, Lie algebraid. And that's your Durham differential. Um, now, for any vector bundle, you can talk about a symplectic structure on the vector bundle. But now, if you have a Lie algebraid, it makes sense to require that that symplectic structure is closed. And I will call that an uh, A closed form, an A symplectic form on the manifold. So it's a two form uh, of, the, uh, of that Lie algebraid, the, uh, degree two, which is closed in the Lie algebraid sense and which is non-degenerate. Um, now, as usual, that gives you an identification just because of the non-degeneracy of the uh, bundle A with its dual. That's this map in the middle. And if you, Post compose that with the anchor and pre-compose it with the transpose of the anchor, you get a map from T star M into T of M, which is the anchor map of a unique Poisson structure on, on, your, uh, on your base manifold. And uh, uh, that is a Poisson structure. And so in particular, uh, because of that, you get uh, a Hamiltonian correspondence functions on M give you Hamiltonian flows on uh, the base manifold. Uh, if you get a little bit more, uh, for functions, you can go to sections. Uh, function F goes to a section sigma of F related by the usual Hamiltonian relationship. You hook the section into the symplectic form. You want to get D of your function. D again in the sense of the Lie algebraid A. And like any section, uh, this Hamiltonian section of F uh, generates a flow on the Lie algebraid, a flow by uh, automorphisms of that Lie algebraid, which are called the Hamiltonian flow of F. If A is the ordinary tangent bundle, uh, 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 no, okay, uh, okay, so if you have a flow on the Lie algebraid, that's uh, in particular, you get an associated flow on the base manifold M. And if uh, A is the ordinary tangent bundle, then it's really that only that base flow, which you call the Hamiltonian flow. But for a Lie algebraid, you also have to uh, re remember the flow on the, on the total space of the Lie algebraid. In the case of the tangent bundle, that's just a tangent lift of what you usually call the Hamiltonian flow. Um, Okay, some examples also mentioned by Nest and Siegen. Um, um, a constant rank Poisson structure um, is, comes from an a symplectic structure in this generalized sense, namely a symplectic structure on the uh, foliation given by the symplectic leaves. 
each of the symplectic leaves, that's the image of the Poisson structure, carries a symplectic structure. So they give, they, together they give you an asymplectic structure on this distribution, this tangent subbundle A of M. The second class of examples is where your manifold is equipped with a uh, divisor, a, a subset of codimension one. Um, to make it not too difficult, let me make it a simple normal crossing divisor, which means that uh, your hypersurface, it's a union of smooth uh, codimension one, connected codimension one submanifolds, which are called the components of that divisor. And I demand that these hypersurfaces are in general position. So if you write this, these surfaces in a suitable local coordinate chart, they will look like coordinate hyperplanes in Rn. They will intersect in general position like coordinate hyperplanes in Rn. So here's an attempt at the picture. M is a surface and uh, Z is this orange thing. So there's four components here. And the vector fields, which are everywhere tangent to this hypersurface, form the sections of a Lie algebraid, which is called the log tangent bundle. So the red uh, lines are my attempt at drawing the flow of a log vector field to everywhere tangent to this divisor. So this is the flow of a typical section of this log tangent bundle. And the sections of the uh, associated Ram complex are called log forms. And a symplectic structure with respect to this Lie algebraid is what we call a log symplectic structure. Thus are some easy examples on uh, in four variables, the constant coefficient, a log symplectic forms. Um, but much depends on how many hypersurfaces you have. Let's just first just take one hyperplane. X1 is equal to zero. So the log uh, tangent bundle is spanned by, but they all have to be tangent to this hypersurface. Um, so you have to take X1, DDX1, and then the DDXI in the other coordinates. And a uh, typical log symplectic form for this hypersurface would look like this. D of log x1 absolute wedge dx2 plus dx3 wedge dx4. Uh, this is only, well, symbolic way of writing. Uh, of course, what it's equal to is dx1 over x1. Um, OK. Um, before I move on to the next example, um, from this formula, you see that the perfectly respectable vector field, DDX2, is Hamiltonian if you allow as Hamiltonian functions this function, which has a pole, log of x1 absolute. So the Hamiltonian correspondence, which I wrote down a few pages ago, uh, also works uh, in this setting for certain functions with poles. I'll come back to this issue. A second example would be where you have, say, four hyperplanes, the union of all the coordinate hyperplanes, and then the log tangent bundle is spanned by all these vector fields. And then a typical log symplectic form would look like this. Um, we allow logs of all the variables. Oh, and here this AI, these coefficients are some anti-symmetric invertible matrix. <clears throat> okay. Um, this much about uh, log symplectic manifolds. Let's move on to reduction. And uh, let me first recall the symplectic case, the classical Marsden Weinstein reduction, where you typically reduce the symplectic manifolds with uh, respect to a vector valued map. 
in the dual of the Lie algebra. And um, well, for a regular value, you take the fiber, the manifold, and uh, in good conditions, that cohydron stabilizer of that point will act freely on that fiber and the quotient manifold is symplectic. As I was mentioning early, earlier, um, in the log symplectic setting, there are natural vector fields that have Hamiltonians with poles. And so the, those Hamiltonian functions will not be defined everywhere. They will be defined only in the complement of this uh, 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 divisor. And to think of this a little differently, instead of thinking of a partially defined function, I can try to uh, I extend that uh, Hamiltonian function across the poles, uh, and that will then go into a partial compactification of the dual of the Lie algebra. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is that we need reduction, not only with values for a map in the dual of the Lie algebra, but a setting uh, uh, studied by Mikami Weinstein, where you have some arbitrary Poisson map of your symplectic manifold is an arbitrary Poisson manifold. And then as they noticed, reduction works very much in the same way. If you have a regular value, a point P in your manifold, now any point in a Poisson manifold um, has a stabilizer, just a stabilizer for the uh, Lie algebraic structure on the cotangent bundle of P. And then that Lie algebra so it's the kernel of the anchor, if you wish, that Lie algebra will act on the fiber and it will act freely. So you get an action Lie algebraid and you could try taking the quotient by that action Lie algebraid. And if that is a manifold in reasonable conditions, that quotient manifold is automatically symplectic. So let me call that Mikami Weinstein reduction. Um, let me do a Lie algebra version of this, which I'm going to need. Um, now I need to make a definition. I'm afraid this clashes with some terminology introduced by uh, Eva Miranda, but I didn't know what else to call it. Um, um, suppose you have some Lie algebra, B over a manifold P, and let's call a Poisson structure on P, a B Poisson structure on P, a section of the second exterior power of B, which satisfies the usual Poisson rule. That the Schouten bracket, uh, any Lie algebra, just like the Ram complex, also has a Schouten bracket on the multi sections. And I want this Schouten bracket in the B sense to vanish. I call that a B Poisson structure. Um, so given such a B Poisson structure, of course, immediately from that, you get an ordinary Poisson structure, uh, just by, uh, so I have this map from dual of B into B given by this, this, this two tensor. And I just pre and post the, uh, compose with the anchor, respectively the transpose of the anchor. And you get an ordinary Poisson structure, anchor map of an ordinary Poisson structure. So B Poisson structures are special kinds of Poisson structures. And additionally, the Poisson structure determines a Lie algebra structure on this gadget, which makes this map in the middle a Lie algebra morphism. <clears throat> um, so some examples of these B Poisson structures. Well, of course, ordinary Poisson structures uh, on P are Poisson with respect to the ordinary, the usual Lie algebra, the tangent bundle. What I earlier called B symplectic structures are obviously B Poisson, they're non -de -non, exactly the non-degenerate B Poisson structures. And then uh, my third class of examples will be what I call a non-abelian moment codomains which is a non-abelian version of a construction 
uh, which is in these two papers, um, where they look at a, um, they study these things for the purposes of log toric varieties. Um, I don't have time to explain this in too much detail, but let me explain uh, one simple uh, thing you can do. Let's start with any Lie algebra. Um, as we know, G star has a canonical Poisson structure uh, written in terms of a basis by the structure constants and it's linear. Now, let me suppose that this basis is such that this first dual basis vector here is a character of G. So it annihilates all Lie brackets. Then that of course is going to mean that uh, certain of the structure constants vanish, namely all the structure constants C, I, J, K, where K is equal to one. So your Poisson structure really only looks, uh, involves these terms, okay? Now what I'm going to do is, in this formula, I'm going to make a substitution. I'm going to leave all of the variables alone, except the x1 variable. I'm going to play, replace x1 by log of x1. And what you get is this. Your Poisson structure becomes this new Poisson structure by tilde where the d dx naught becomes, sorry, d dx1 becomes an x1, d dx1. That's the only thing that has changed. So this is your new Poisson structure. And now as it happens, this Poisson, this new Poisson structure, which a priori might be singular for x1 is zero, is not singular. It extends smoothly across this hyperplane x1 is equal to zero. And in fact, because of this x1 d dx1, this is a log Poisson structure with respect to this hyperplane x1 is equal to zero. It's b Poisson uh, on this manifold g star, where b is the log uh, tangent bundle of p. Um, now, uh, according to x1 is less than zero, x1 is greater than zero, this new Poisson manifold contains two copies and two sides of the hyperplanes of the original Lie Poisson manifold. And in the middle, you have one copy of a hyperplane. What is that hyperplane? Well, again, that is a Lie Poisson structure. Namely, your character defines an ideal in your Lie algebra. So in particular, Lie subalgebra, co-dimension one, and you take the dual of that. So you join two copies of the original Lie Poisson structure with in the middle, a hyperplane defined by this Lie Poisson structure. So that's what's going on. Can I ask a quick question? Uh, yes. Is it possibly a real blow up? Um, Just this last sentence seems to suggest it because uh, you can do a real blow up of a manifold along a hypersurface and then basically get uh, to the original manifold. I think if you do a real blow up, you get a Poisson structure that blows up along the hypersurface. So it's kind of opposite to that, but that's just a tentative answer. I'd have to think a little more about that. Thank you. Um, Is it defined on the same space as before? Uh, well, I did a, um, the way I wrote it, yes. I have my same copy of Rn with coordinates x1 up to xn. And I just give it by this formula. But in a sense, it's a compactification of the 
original Poisson structure? Uh, not so much a compactification. Um, it contains two copies of the original Poisson structure and they're joined together by this hyperplane. So each closed half space is a partial compactification. Huh? But the original space but... is not contained in the new space. The, the new space contains two copies of the old space. But but Briar, is there some map relating the two Poisson structures? Um, you have two inclusions of the old Poisson structure into the new one. Uh, the, the left side of the hyperplane and the right side of the hyperplane. But not any kind of blow up map? No, no, no. Okay. Um, let me just write this out in a small example. This is the three-dimensional Heisenberg, which is these matrices. Let me define the, identify the dual with the lower uh, triangular matrices. Um, so just the central extension of R2. Um, and you have two characters. The space of characters is two-dimensional. The X1 and the X2 coordinates. Now, here on the left is a picture of the ordinary Heisenberg Lie algebra. As we all know, you have the coordinate orbits are the horizontal planes, x3 is constant, uh, with this symplectic structure on the leaves. Of course, that degenerates uh, at the plane x3 is zero, but uh, that's the shaded plane. Uh, that, of course, is because the, the coadjuvant orbits become points. And this is the Poisson structure here. Okay, uh, let me take a character. Let me just take the character um, defined by X1. Okay, but then it means I take this tensor and I just multiply it by X1. Um, so um, I have this red hyperplane here. And then to the left of that hyperplane and to the right of that hyperplane are two copies of the original uh, Lie Poisson structure. And then in the middle, I have a Poisson structure on this the Poisson sub manifold on the red hyperplane, uh, which is in, in this simple case is just a billion. <clears throat> okay. Um, you can repeat this process. I could do this again. I can start from this Poisson tensor, and now I can just multiply through by the by another character of the Heisenberg Lie algebra, say the character given by x2, and uh, that that moves it amount to multiplying this thing by x2. Another thing you can do is, well, the Lie Poisson structure, the original one, is translationally invariant in the x2 and the x1 directions. So instead of um, um, doing this trick at this uh, linear hyperplane, I could have done it at a shifted hyperplane. Could have worked equally well. So what I'm saying is that if you repeat tricks like this, you can produce log Poisson structures on well, a space uh, is diffeomorphic to the original dual Lie algebra. And then the formula would look something like this. This would be log Poisson um, uh, with respect to the divisor given by these three hyperplanes. Okay. So that is my third example of what I call a log Poisson structure. Any more questions? Okay, so let, now, let me now explain what I mean by reduction. Suppose I give myself two manifolds, M and P, and suppose one manifold carries a Lie algebroid with a symplectic structure, and then a second manifold, which carries one, a Lie algebroid with one of these B Poisson structures. 
Now suppose I have a morphism from one Lie algebroid to the other Lie algebroid, which preserve, preserves the Poisson structures. Okay? So that's a generalized sense of moment map uh, of this Mikami Weinstein context. Okay. Now what is reduction? You take a point in this target Poisson manifold. Uh, let's suppose it's the regular value. Again, let's look at the stabilizer, Lie algebra. So that's just this stabilizer for this Lie algebra, not the Lie algebra B, but the dual Lie algebra given by the Poisson structure. And let's take the fiber. So that's then going to be a submanifold of M. And then the reduction theorem says that that fiber, let's call it Y, and includes into M, inclusion map J, it's co-isotropic. And it transversely intersects the anchor of the original symplectic Lie algebra, an M. That means you can pull back the Lie algebra to the submanifold Y. So it's J, J shriek of A. And the stabilizer Lie algebra of the point P acts freely on that Lie algebra. And on the underlying submanifold, the orbits of the action of the Lie algebra are the same as the leaves of the null foliation of the restriction of the symplectic form. Okay. Now, suppose I can form the leaf space of that foliation. Suppose it is a manifold. And this foliation also carries a natural connection on this restricted Lie algebra. Suppose that connection as trivial holonomy. Then, so you can form this quotient manifold and that quotient manifold carries a quotient Lie algebra and your symplectic form descends to an asymplectic form uh, on that quotient manifold. So that's the reduction theorem. Um, so two final remarks on this topic. The case where uh, my target manifold is just the dual Lie algebra is uh, done in an older paper around 2011, I believe. And also I need to remind you that this fits in a broader context. Um, any Lie algebra give you a current algebra A plus A dual. And a symplectic structure defines a Dirac structure inside that current algebra. And seeing in this light, the reduction theorem is an instance of Dirac reduction. So it's, the theorem is a special case of the bursting Krynic Dirac reduction theorem. With, of course, the additional information, but the bursting Krynic theorem tells you that there will be a reduced Dirac structure on the quotient manifold. But in this case, the reduced Dirac structure is actually a symplectic structure with respect to a Lie algebra. Okay. Um, so that much about reduction. Let me move on to quantization, which means different things to different people. Deformation quantization or geometric quantization, but uh, that's much too hard for me today. Um, instead, I'm going to do something else, which for want of an accepted name, I will call um, poor man's quantization. It's a crude approximation. of geometric quantization. So what is it? Well, for an ordinary symplectic manifold, 
you do need the usual thing, a pre-quantum line bundle, a Hermitian line bundle, whose curvature is a symplectic form. But instead of a polarization, which you need for geometric quantization, you use something much floppier. You use just the almost complex structure compatible with the symplectic form. And that gives you a Dolbo uh, type operator, uh, which does not square to zero like uh, on a complex manifold. But if you roll it up, you get a Dolbo Dirac operator, which is an, ellip uh, uh, an elliptic complex, uh, an elliptic operator. And you could take its index. And that I call my poor man's quantization of M. Uh, if your data are all equivariant with respect to some Lie group, G, the M is equipped with some Hamiltonian action and your line bundle is equivariant, then this index, or well, the kernel minus the co-kernel will be, uh, there will be representations of your group. So the difference will be a formal representation, a virtual character or an element of the representation ring of the group. Um, well, this has obvious disadvantages. Really, this is not physics. It's more like a chapter of mathematics. It works well only, um, really well, only if the manifold, uh, both the manifold and the group are compact. Yeah? Um, which of course is kind of laughable from a physics point of view, but well. And the, the, the second bad thing that instead of a proper Hilbert space, it just gives you a number and not even a positive number, but possibly potentially a negative number yeah? or a virtual character in the equivariant setting instead of what you really want, a unitary representation. Um, but of course it also has some advantages. For one thing, you don't need a polarization, it's obviously independent of any polarizations. And in a broad sense, it's computable in the sense that you have a big handle on it. Uh, it's, it's an index. So you have the whole apparatus of index theory to bring to bear on it. And by doing that, uh, Eckhart, some, some time ago, how long ago, 25 years ago, um, established a theorem for the quantization of a symplectic manifold with a Hamiltonian action. You can decompose this uh, representation of G into its isotypical subspaces. <coughs> it's a sum over all the irreducible representations parameterized by the dominant weights. My, my group here is compact connected. Um, so each dominant weight defines you an irreducible character and that character has a multiplicity. This is the dimension of the isotypical component. And the quantization commutative reduction theorem tells you that those multiplicities are given by, well, the index, the quantization of the symplectic quotients of M. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Um, and also in that generality, it's it's joint work with Rayer, I should say. <laughs> Let's not forget. Oh, I forgot about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, now we have some ideas on how to do this for arbitrary symplectic Lie algebraids, but so far we only have results for the log symplectic case. So let me finish by explaining that a little bit. Um, so this build on work of um, Gilliman, Miranda Weitzman, and a more recent paper by Braverman, Loisy, and Song. We go back to a manifold with a simple normal, normal crossing divisor and a log symplectic form. Um, the first problem you run into when you try to run this machinery is that um, a log symplectic manifold has no obvious almost complex structure. The log tangent bundle is symplectic, therefore almost complex, but the ordinary tangent bundle is not. 
Um, however, there's a way to work around this. Let me explain that to you. Um, let me bring in another little ingredient. Let's look at the sheaf of all functions which vanish on the hypersurface. Well, it's a uh, normal crossing divisor. So that's a locally free sheaf of rank one, a line bundle in other words. So the sections of this line bundle are just the fun functions that vanish along the hypersurface. <clears throat> if you restrict to the hypersurface, that's just the co-normal bundle. And that bundle, line bundle, I of Z is trivial precisely when that hypersurface has a global defining function. Um, now, how does the log tangent bundle compare to the tangent bundle? Well, there's one obvious comparison between the two, that's the anchor map. Likewise, this ideal line bundle obviously maps into the trivial line bundle because a function that vanishes along Z is in particular a function. Yes, you can map functions that vanish along Z to all functions. Um, so that gives you a vector bundle map from the direct sum. This line bundle plus the log tangent bundle to the trivial line bundle plus the tangent bundle. Uh, it's block diagonal. That's a sum of two vector bundle maps. And the upper left, we just have the map in, uh, induced by the inclusion. And in the lower right corner, we have the anchor. Now, away from the hypersurface, that's an isomorphism, but on the hypersurface it's not, of course, because the, the anchor map is one dimensional kernel and this map too has a one dimensional kernel. So there's a two dimensional kernel along the hypersurface. So here's the trick. You can perturb this map on the hypersurface to an isomorphism, a global isomorphism which coincides with that original bundle map outside the small neighborhood of the divisor. That gives you something nice because that means if uh, your hypersurface is a global defining function, then your manifold is a natural homotopy class of almost complex structures. Why? Well, let's look at the tangent bundle. Let's add a trivial plane bundle by the dirty trick, this is isomorphic to the log tangent bundle plus this ideal line bundle plus one trivial line bundle. But there's a global defining function. So this bundle is trivial. So we get this. Now M has a log symplectic structure. So this has a complex structure. So the whole thing has a complex structure. So you get a stable, almost complex structure on your manifold. Um, let me show you the proof of this trick. It's actually very easy. Um, let me show it to you in the case where Z consists of a single smooth submanifold. Um, and let me choose a chart on my manifold, the local coordinates in which the hypersurface is given by first coordinate equal to zero. So in that chart, my tangent bundle has a frame, just the DDXIs, the usual frame. The log tangent bundle has this frame. You just multiply the first one by X1, you get this frame. The trivial line bundle has frame, the constant function one. And the ideal line bundle has as frame, the defining function X1. Now that vector bundle map I wrote, naturally defined vector bundle has a matrix with respect to these frames. And what is it? Well, this generator goes to X1 times this generator. So it gives you this matrix entry. This generator goes to X1 times this generator and gives you this matrix entry and all the other matrix entries, it's diagonal, all the other matrix entries are one. Obviously this matrix has a two dimensional null space if X1 is zero. But equally obviously, you can perturb it away to an invertible matrix just by adding some off diagonal entries. 
Uh, namely, I add a little bump function of x1. Uh, so a function which is one, where x1 is zero, and which drops down to zero. And you make it an invertible matrix. And that gives you your isomorphism. If x1 is light, so away from the hypersurface, this is my original isomorphism. So that's the stable, almost complex structure of a manifold of a log symplectic manifold, which I only needed to assume that my hypersurface has a global defining function. But of course, from a stable, almost complex structure, by reduction of structure group, you get a spincy structure and therefore an elliptic operator, a Dirac operator for a spincy structure, which is elliptic. And therefore we get an index. And I will use that operator to define my poor man's quantization. Um, so equivalently, what do you do? So again, let's look at a compact connected Lie group acting on my manifold, preserving my hypersurface. And suppose this is action on the complement uh, where I have a symplectic form is Hamiltonian in the traditional sense with a usual moment map into G star. Such an action, such a moment map has what we call modular weights, a bunch of characters. Um, for each component of the divisor, I have my symplectic form as a residue, which is a one form, well-defined one form de defined on the component of that divisor. I take that one form. Now my components are all preserved by this group action. So I can hook into it the generator for a Lie algebra element. Xi, you can hook that into this one form. And that's then a function on the component Zi with values in the dual Lie algebra. The moment map condition which is valid on the complement of C, gives you two facts about this map, namely that it is constant, in other words, just it's a constant element of G star, and that that constant element of G star is a character of G. I call that character the modular weight of the moment map of the, or of the G action at this component of the hypersurface. And I define the G action on this log symplectic manifold to be Hamiltonian if when adding these terms to the moment map, your map will extend smoothly to all of M. Here these HIs are defining functions for my components. <clears throat> okay, so with all this in place, suppose I have my pre-quantized, pre-quantum pre line bundle, and suppose you assume you have a global defining function for the divisor, you can define this index, and it will be a virtual character of G. Now let me state the theorem, I need one more ingredient. Um, for some of these divisor components, zi, this modular weight character will be smooth, which means that the original map already extends smoothly across that divisor. So let me gather together all those components of my divisor where the modular weight is not zero. Now I need to put in an assumption. Um, even if my original manifold is compact, if I uh, leave out this divisor, so uh, this moment map may no longer be proper. So I need to put that in as an assumption. But if that holds, then my character, my virtual character decomposes. It decomposes in the usual way as in the Meinrenken theorem as a uh, direct sum of 
irreducible characters where the multiplicities are given by the symplectic quotients. So some remarks about the theorem. These quotients themselves are log symplectic. And to tie in this moment map, which what I said earlier about these Poisson valued moment maps, um, you can manufacture a momentum codomain with a, a Poisson manifold, a B Poisson manifold, um, uh, with respect to a, Lie, a manifold B with a Lie algebraid over it and a Poisson structure on it, which contains a number of copies of this G and the moment that will extend to this momentum codomain. And having done that, you can make sense of the reduced spaces at infinity, so to speak, where you take points P, which are not contained in G star, but in the hyperplanes at infinity. The quantization, however, does not feel these reduced spaces at infinity. So in a sense, that's disappointing perhaps. Perhaps there are more uh, sophisticated K-theory invariants of this uh, log symplectic manifold that do detect the uh, symplectic quotients at infinity. And God, that went way faster than I expected. Um, I thought I had too much material. Um, Uh, so I didn't write this out in my notes, but um, let me finish by at least sketching. Um, an example where you can explicitly write out this quantization commutative with reduction theorem. Um, that's an extension of torque manifolds um, done by, uh, by Gualtieri and Lee and Pelayo and Ratio In symplectic geometry, you can construct um, um, from decent polytopes called Dalzan polytopes, uh, manifolds with Hamiltonian torus actions, all whose uh, reduced spaces are points and whose um, moment map image is exactly that polytope. There's a corresponding construction, corresponding theory in the world of log uh, symplectic manifolds and I've worked out with these people. So here your group, it's a torus, your polytope uh, sits inside one of these B Poisson manifolds, which are um, called a momentum codomain, and which contains many copies of this dual Lie algebra. And <clears throat> um, It would really take me too much time to explain in detail uh, how this is defined and uh, what a polytope means in a momentum codomain. But let me at least briefly try to write down what the answer is for the quantization. This momentum codomain has a divisor, is itself uh, it, uh, the log Poisson. It has a divisor. D and a map complement of the divisor is a number of copies of the dual Lie algebra and if you take one of these log Delzan polytopes and you form the corresponding 
log toy variety, you can quantize it. Well, on the general principles, the answer is a sum over the weight lattice of the toys. You get the character of the torus, and you get the multiplicity. Now, what are these multiplicities? In ordinary toric geometry, um, these multiplicities are all equal to zero or one. It's equal to one exactly when this lambda is an integral point in your polytope. This is no longer true in the log toric world. These multiplicities are as follows. Um, it's a sum uh, over all points. Um, you so your lambda is in here. And it has a number of uh, pre-images in here, discrete set. So I of P is lambda. And then you get a sign for each of these points such that P maps into lambda. Um, I'm sorry, it's a correction. Uh, and intersect this with the polytope. You have to be in the polytope and you have to map to lambda. And for each such P, you pick up a sign. The problem is that for a lock, toric symplectic manifold, the reduced spaces are no longer just a single point, but they're a discrete set of points. And this discrete set of points come with signs, plus or a minus. Where do these signs come from? Well, it comes from the fact that in a log symplectic manifold, uh, say we had this stable, uh, almost complex structure, um, and uh, the, the orientation, with respect to that stable almost complex structure does not match the log symplectic, uh, the, the, the orientation given by the log symplectic form away from the hypersurface. And there are these sign discrepancies and, that, 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 and that's what these signs come from. Okay, um, anyway, outside the polytope, all these numbers are going to be zero, but inside you could get something different. Um, and I think this is a good place to stop. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks a lot, Rio. And can we have questions? Anybody would like to ask a question? I have a question. Very simple. Can you explain? Uh, can I ask you a question? No. I have trouble hearing you, Joel. Are you having trouble hearing me? And uh, now I can hear you. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Um, the when you say uh, a moment map codomain containing many copies of the the the, the, the dual of the, the algebra of the torus. Mm -hmm. and, when you're saying that, you mean it's like this construction that you gave, where you where you like split it along hyperplane? Is where it I glued, yes, where I glued two copies of that Heisenberg Lie algebra together along a hyperplane. Yes, it's like that, but for for tori. Okay, 
So you're and and you're really just imagining these are hyperplanes, or these are, or you're just imagining there's an arbitrary divisor in like Rn that in each component is some copy of the. Um, do you see what I'm asking? I'm not sure how to answer this. Um, <clears throat> The, the hypersurface depends on on two things. It depends on the choice of a character of your Lie algebra. So for a torus, that's just some arbitrary covector. And um, the smooth structure on the momentum codomain also depends on the choice of a of a vector in the Lie algebra, which pairs with that character. Uh, uh, um, yeah. So, so I had this um, Lie algebra with its usual Poisson structure, and then I chose a character. Um, but to get a hyperplane in G star, in addition to this character, you also need an, a vector, an integer vector. And then from that choice, you can make a new Poisson structure. on G, which I call P tilde, and which, uh, yeah, which is log Poisson, along the hypersurface given by this vector. <laughs> I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but, um, I, I guess I was just wondering about the definition on the on the previous slide. Uh, what exactly you were assuming P was? So you're assuming it it is. I, I didn't I didn't explain. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> can I can I can I can I maybe make a comment? Uh, yeah. On this thing. So yes. Basically, I mean, you can think of a dual of a Lie algebra as you know vector space with a linear Poisson structure. Now, if I try to do this in the B world, I will have a vector space with an hyperplane. And I look at, let's say, linear functions that have log uh, singularities along the hypersurface. And I look at Poisson brackets for which the bracket of such things is so-called linear. So it's, again, uh, a linear combination. And isn't that the kind of Poisson structure P that you are talking about? Yes, I think that's a fine way of saying it. Thank you, Rui. I believe there was a question from Michelle also. Um, yes, so uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes. I can hear you, yes. Okay, uh, I guess maybe I missed uh, some point. You defined the uh, quantization which uh, involved uh, little omega and uh, line bundle L. Yes. What is the relation between omega and L? Oh, yes. Um, you caught me out. I told a little bit of a lie here. Mm. So let me try to correct that. So what is this pre-quantum line bundle? Pre-quantization of so I have this log symplectic manifold. Um, it's a line bundle whose Hermitian line bundle whose curvature is not exactly omega. 
because uh, that would give you trouble because omega blows up near the hypersurface. Instead, what you do is, um, well, there is this, um, um, This is Lie algebraic cohomology. Um, the, the the cohomology of the of the uh, complex of log uh, of log k forms. Let me denote it like this. And. The anchor map gives you a pullback map of ordinary Durham cohomology. And the log symplectic form defines a class in the Lie algebraic cohomology. So we're not exactly in the right place. Um, if I want a line bundle, its chunk class should be inside here. Now, there is a map going the other way. Kind of a push forward map. And that was written by uh, Mazzeo and Melrose. The, and in fact, they showed, they computed the uh, Lie algebra cohomology. And it, as it contains as a direct summand, the usual cohomology. And then a whole bunch of stuff coming from the hypersurfaces. And then with shifts built in. Okay, so what I'm pre-quantizing is not this class omega, but I'm pre-quantizing is its projection onto here, which is given by a form, uh, so L. Okay, so somewhat you have uh, some uh, integrality condition, modulo, yes. some uh, cohomology, which comes from the banda, from the hypersurface. So no, omega, right. omega should not be nice. The project, there is some projection of omega which should be integral. Yes. Modulo, some uh, cohomology coming from the Z, okay? That's right. In the case of a single hypersurface, what this omega bar is, more or less you're subtracting off the terms from omega that contain logarithmic terms. So you only take the finite part. Um, and uh, the volume of M, so the, this form may, omega bar may be degenerate, but the volume of M with respect to omega bar is the same as it is with respect to omega. Um, yeah. Um. And your dirty trick, may I ask in this construction, what happens with the cohomology class? The dirty trick. Uh, what cohomology class are we talking about? Omega. Mm hmm. I don't know. Um, it's a good question. I'm not sure I can figure it out on the fly. I'll have to think about it. Yeah, I have another question. Um, hi, Rare. Um, hi, yeah, going back, to, going back to Michelle's question, maybe you go back to your last slide. Um, 
Yeah, we're, um, let's see. Um, I guess keep going. Uh, not the last slide, but your last one after you started writing comments. Yeah, um, on this, could you say that the, what you need for the pre-quantization is a Lie algebraid connection on this line bundle um, rather than an ordinary connection, which means you co covariant differentiate by sections of the Lie algebraid. And I believe that should have a curvature, which is this could be this two form omega. Um. Such a connection itself would it have a log term also. Uh, yes, presumably, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of a, um, okay, again, yeah, I don't example, know. If the, the, if the, where the bundle is trivial, which is always true locally, the connection is given by a it get basically given by a one form and mm -hmm. but it would be a Lie algebraid one form so that would mm -hmm. be a, something mm -hmm. with a log singularity in this version of the story we're not quantizing omega directly we're just quantizing a portion of this from omega um, I'm not sure, if, I don't think this, content, this, this continues smoothly across the hypersurface and its connection form would be a standard two form, not a log, a standard one form, not a log one form. Um, and we only need an integrality condition on this class. I see, well. So it's yeah, it's it's there, perhaps okay, not there, perhaps there. not the obvious uh, pre quantum uh, pre quantization condition that you would expect. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's um. I mean, there should be a theory of the algebra connections on line bundles um, that into which this should fit. But um, I mean, yes. that's another that's for another day. Um. Right, yes. And we should also like to be able to quantize symplectic Lie algebraids other than uh, uh, other than the log symplectic ones. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't think I mentioned when Nest and Siegen introduced this whole business of symplectic Lie algebraids because they noticed, this was in the days before Konsevich uh, uh, proved deformation quantization of Poisson manifolds, they noticed that they could do the entire Fedosov story of deformation quantization for arbitrary log, for arbitrary symplectic Lie algebraids. Okay, I see uh, Francois Ziegler had his hand up for quite a while. Oh, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear I me? Yes. All right. Two two short questions then by now. You said you only quantize the part omega bar of omega. Uh, right. Is, is that related to why you miss the stuff at, the, at infinity that you mentioned or a completely different problem? Um, <clears throat> probably not. We are inclined to think not. Um, in the case of a single hypersurface, uh, uh, this quantization commutes with reduction uh, had um, been done in a different way by Braverman and, uh, and uh, our co-authors Loisides and Sung. And instead of this uh, uh, almost stably, almost complex Dirac operator, they used a different operator defined on the complement of the hypersurface, but they imposed a kind of uh, atia patodi boundary conditions. And that operator, uh, that they put in the line bundle, I think, which had this curvature form. 
but if they take the Patodi singer index, the applied index theory to that different operator, they still don't find any contributions from infinity. In other words, they still get the same quantization. It really okay. seems, yeah, um, that this version of quantization does not capture any, anything of the divisor at infinity. All right. And the other very short questions, just terminology. I was I was curious. You said uh, Hamiltonians with, with poles. Yes. They are more like essential singularities, right? Uh, okay, a logarithmic pole. Yes, of course. Yes. Okay, but of course this Let's is all this. Yes. Maybe I have one short question. Uh, you didn't say anything about the method of proof you're using for your quantization commutative reduction theorem. Uh, it's just, just in general term, what, 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 what are you using? Is it something like norm squared localization or so? Um, yes, you use the flow of the norm square of the moment map, uh, but um, you, you need to modify it a little bit, bit near the divisor. But other than that, these uh, methods uh, uh, developed by Paradin and uh, Vernier, they, they work, K-theoretic K localization, they, they work like a charm here, and that's what we use. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so you are not using the dirty trick in the proof. You were just using this, because then I'm confused. If, if one has integral class, how do you know that after the dirty tree you have integral class and that you can apply? I had understood that you were using this dirty trick, but it was just. Uh, no, we need the dirty trick to get the uh, elliptic operator. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, to get that spin C structure that gives you the, this Fred Holm operator. And then you need to couple that Dirac operator with a line bundle. That's the second ingredient. So these are two separate independent ingredients. Okay, but you don't need you don't need uh, you don't need integral condition for that. Uh, for this uh, stable, almost uh, complex structure, no, you don't need that. No, okay. it has nothing to do with the line okay. bundle. Okay, great. Good. Yeah, I, I got a rather naive question. Uh, so I maybe got a little bit confused. How non-abelian is the story, right? Because you had some kind of non-abelian looking examples, uh, but then you, you're saying that we need to use a character, right? So, so, so and then the main example was that with uh, 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 log toric manifolds. So, so what's, uh, what, what's, what would be a typical non-abelian example or how non-abelian this theory is? Um, you're right. Um, so we had this uh, moment map condition uh, um, let me go back to the modular weights. Um, <clears throat> these modular weights are characters of the Lie algebra. Yeah. Of course, if D is semi-simple, you don't have any. Yeah. So then in the semi-simple Lie algebra, you're just requiring that your moment map should extend smoothly to M. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there are no logarithmic poles from you for if uh, G is semi-simple. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So only what matters for these modular weights is uh, you know, what happens in the direction of the center of the group. Mm -hmm. Yes. But, but then is there still some interest in interplay between the semi-simple and the abelian parts? Mm. Of course, that's not a very well-defined question, right? So... Mm. Um, um, even if your group is semi-simple, so these symplectic quotients in general will in general be log symplectic manifolds. Yeah? <laughs> they will certainly not be symplectic manifolds. 
Um, mm -hmm. Even though the moment hub has no poles. Yeah. So the zero fiber itself could intersect uh, could intersect the divisor at, at the exceptional divisor. And your symplectic quotient at zero picks up a divisor itself. Mm -hmm. um, so there is content to the theorem, even if the algebra is semi-simple. Mm -hmm. uh, would you have uh, some nice example in mind or that would be difficult? Um, Okay, uh, frankly, the only examples we've worked out so far was the log uh, toric ones, mm -hmm. yeah. Do, don't you have, like, I like when I try to find examples myself, mm -hmm. like the semi-simple part can only in a way act on the symplectic part. So do you think by yeah. constant well, you have this co-dimensional affiliation or on the components that you have on this normal crossing, mm -hmm. then, then you can only have semi-simple components acting, acting in the directions of the symplectic foliation. Mm -hmm. So in a way, in this case, this reduction should, I agree with, with Anton, that if you play the reduction, you should still get some lock components in the reduction. You don't kill them. That's what I well, think. Um, yeah, you certainly get a lock symplectic, symplectic quotient, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's say to have examples, you need to have some, if you want to have non-trivial examples, you need to have some S1 direction uh, for the log part. For if you want examples of where the moment map uh, has poles. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's, yes. that's what I mean. Exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or of course a non-semi simply algebra, but then of course the whole theory of the the whole index theory doesn't really work uh, very well. Yeah, exactly. So in a neighborhood of Z, you need to have like a product structure where the semi simple part can only act on on the symplectic leaves on on Z, right? Uh, I, I, I suppose yes. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, so any further questions, anybody? Yeah, so if, if not, then let's thank Rhea again for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Next week, we are going to have uh, Marco Gualtieri, title to be announced. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks, Eckhart.